and welcome to Overtime Hockey Talk. My name is Mark Paul. My co-host Justin Baker joining me for the mid-season awards. Hello, Justin. Oh, hi. I was waiting for your uh, your applause. You know. Yes, mid-season. There we, we made go. it, everybody. There we go. I should say Overtime Hockey Talks mid-season awards because you know there are really no trophies like some of these trophies that we hand out. Uh, especially what the least likely to score a goal that's that's probably my favorite i think it's this a fan is, favorite for I think sure this is the third second or third year that we've done it second, second year it's just the second year yeah yeah uh, third year we we just ripped apart riley sheehan for half the season so very true and then i think he's he ended up scoring so like the last game the of the last year <laughs> game of the year yeah bastard he ruined everything <laughs> riley you ruin everything um yeah it'll be that's that's just always a fun list um uh, and just for uh, no, you know we'll get we'll get into it when we when we jump into it. So midseason awards, we're you know we're looking at the first half of the NHL season. Uh, I know technically we're you know, just shy of the midway point, but here's my feeling: the NHL just announced basically the the all stars that they want to be there, and then the, the rest of them they're like, okay, fans, you can decide. But um, here's every team's pick. I, I feel like that's the halfway point. You know, I hear who's going to what team uh, in the All Star. Like when once the NHL starts thinking of the All Star game, that's halfway. So there's there's my my caveat there. We're we're basically halfway. We're like some teams are halfway. Washington's halfway, um, and Los Angeles is past the halfway point. So it would be rude to Los Angeles not to do this show today. That's very true. And I personally, for me, I like to think of the last you know five to ten ish games as almost a throwaway for most teams anyways. So um, that's to me true. really, yeah, really when you get around 35, I really think that's a good halfway mark for most players, especially because a lot of guys are getting injured too. So really, you know, between 70 and 80 games really to me is where I think. There was like one playoff season. race at the very end last year. And right, that was it. right. So, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, with that said, you know, I, I think we're going to get the show started with, uh, you know, the first trophy is going to go to uh, these guys' first year in the league, and that's the Calder Trophy. So, uh, I did you have did you give three uh, for each of these, or did you just pick a winner, um, or did you have like a top ten for every list? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. I just wouldn't be surprised, folks. That's <laughs> to be quite honest. So, I have a top three. However, I did pick my you know, my winner, my person. I think I would I would give this award to so. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, I am the same way. I'll, uh, you know, I, what do we want to start with our, uh, with our number one or our number three? Do we just want to like get it out of the way? Who, who yeah, wins let's, it? let's, well, no, right. no, we'll let's, start let's with do some build up. Come on. We'll start with that. <laughs> okay. We'll build up. That's fine. Um, uh, okay. Well, where, uh, where are you starting with? All right. Number three, I'm going to go Stuart Skinner. Um, I really like what he's been able to do in, in Edmonton. And, and frankly, when you look at the defense in front of him, that's not really the greatest. And, and then you look, you know, his 1B, 1A, whatever you want to call it, call it counterpart. And Jack Campbell hasn't had the best of season. So for Skinner to come in and be able to perform the way he has and um, he's put up some pretty decent numbers. So to me, I, I just I, I love what he's doing. And I, I think at least he's got to get some consideration here. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, he's uh, he's been solid for Edmonton. Really, the reason why Edmonton hasn't completely fallen off the wagon. So you definitely have to uh, have to give it to him there. Uh, my number three is uh, as a Buffalo Saber. I'm going Owen Power. Uh, he said I had a fantastic start. I it's hard for me to, to toss defensemen into the, the number one spot when you have someone who's doing as well as the number one spot is. Um and but Buffalo is surging, so I won't. I, I'm definitely not ruling out that he wins this eventually. Uh, but I'll say he could also be on my list for least likely to score a goal <laughs> because he has none so far. Uh, zero goals in 33 games, but he is a like, he. He's averaging 23 minutes and 42 seconds a game. I mean that's tops amongst all rookies. It's uh, pretty impressive. Uh, and and that's tops by far. The next is uh, Jake Sanderson at twenty one oh one. So uh, it's he's just he's been playing fantastic, and the Sabers have been much better. Uh, I'll say the second half of the first half, if that makes sense. So uh, I'm going to give Owen Power that nod. Love it. 
All right, you're number two for the call. Number two. Yeah, I've got uh, Matty Beneers from the Seattle Kraken. He's leading the race right now in terms of scoring for for all rookie uh, skaters. And obviously 28 points in 38 games is pretty dang good for a Seattle team and who, in my opinion, really don't have, um, you know, a, a traditional top line guy, right? If you look at, you know, when you look at the Colorados and some of the, the superstar teams of the world, you know, your, your Toronto Maple Leafs and you think of, you know, somebody in the, on that top line, right. is probably a guy who could put, put a point point per game up. Maybe, you know, you talk about your William Nylanders, yep. um, you know, your Miko Rantanen's, these guys who get consideration and Matty Beneers really is playing with guys who are, in my opinion, second line players like, uh, you know, Jordan Emberley and, and Barakowski. And he's, he's putting up some pretty good numbers and, and doing it, you know, again, not reading too much into the plus minus, but he's, he's a plus five. So to be on a, a team that's, you know, still learning to play together as a whole group and for a guy so young to come in and, and just fill in that, that top six center position so well, I, uh, I got to go ba- Matty Beneers at number two. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I have Matty Beneers at number one. I'll just tell you that now I, I have him winning the Calder, uh, okay. He's just been. I mean, he's he is the number one center on a team that's in the playoffs. That is very unique. That, that's that's something that you don't see very often. Um, oftentimes, we see you know a a really good player who gets you know maybe they get drafted uh, high up in their draft and and you see them contend for that Calder Trophy, like almost like an Austin Matthews. And but his his first year. Uh, was it his rookie year they made the playoffs? I'm trying to remember. Was that his rookie year or the this, this second year? Damn, I forget. Oh, yeah, uh, I forget too. <laughs> but in, in those, like, I feel like making the playoffs and being the number one center, that's that's an extra layer. Like, as a rookie, your team does not have to make the playoffs at all. And and you could still win the, the Calder Trophy. It, it really has nothing to do with it. Um, at, at least... You know, it, it's okay if they don't because generally you're going, well, some of the best rookies are going to be on some of the worst teams. You know, like Mason McTavish. Uh, if he was having a, I, I don't, I'm not saying that he's having a bad year, uh, but he definitely has not been the dominant force that some people were uh, pumping his tires before before this year. Uh, not to say that he, he won't become that. He's still having a nice year, 22 points. Probably will end up with uh, between 45 and 50, but his team's not going to make the playoffs. It doesn't really matter if he was having a, you know, 10, 20 more point season, he would be right in that conversation. So for the Calder, it doesn't matter for other trophies, like maybe the heart, the Norris, you almost have to make the playoffs to win that trophy, those trophies. Uh, Beautiful. uh, So I'm wondering who your number. Well, I guess I'm going to say my number two. I feel like it's probably going to be your number one. Uh, I'm going Logan Thompson as my number two. Uh, Yeah, you are correct. uh, 18 wins, a 915 save percentage. Uh, He's kind of he he has cooled off a little bit, Um, but I'll say for my money, there just is something about a 25 year old being a rookie of the year that I don't like. (laughs) He's 25. He's already like um, basically the average age of an NHL player. I. What what is the average age of an NHL player? That's a good question. I mean, so here's the thing. I pretty much had 27. him and Logan. Twenty seven. Okay, nice. So he's a little younger. Great. Um, and technically, the cutoff is twenty six for the Calder. But um, I will say I had him and Maddie Beneers sort of tied. I couldn't make a decision. And of course, whenever it comes down to a goaltender versus skater, <laughs> I always give the nod to the goalie. So. <laughs> yep, I love it. I mean, hey, he. I mean, he's eligible for the trophy, so he's got to be in that conversation. I'll say he certainly has a much better team in front of him than a guy like Owen Power or someone like Maddie Beneers that has is playing with. Uh, I think Logan Thompson is certainly uh, not that not to take away what he's been able to do, but it has been enhanced by the players in front of him. Sure, but so, I will say in his defense, though, he spent a, a big chunk of the season without guys like, um, you know, uh, Jack Eichel's been out, uh, Shea Theodore has missed a lot of time, and with guys in and out of lineup, and pretty much you're relying on as your top center for Chandler Stevenson for a lot of the year. Yeah, but that's what I, they always did. Yeah, I know, but I... <laughs> I feel like the Knights are just better when they rely on Chandler Stevenson as their number one center. I don't know. I mean, I, I love sure seeing like Eichel and Chandler Stevenson on the same line together. They just... 
it clicked. And of course, Eichel came back last night and three points was pretty good for my fantasy. So uh, I'll take it. Why not? Um, okay. Well, we'll we'll have to you know we'll see what happens uh, moving forward. But that that rookie of the year, it kind of feels like those three four guys. You know, I I honestly I can't believe that Owen Power wasn't on your list. Um, Stewart, he hasn't scored a goal. <laughs> yeah, but he's he's averaging. <laughs> 24 minutes a game almost as a rookie and he's a plus 13 uh his possession numbers are good like uh, yeah his underlying stats are great too so uh i just i feel like he's a he, he should be on there Stuart skinner has only played how many games has Sk- Stuart skinner play so so here's my knock on, 18 on owen. yeah so here's my knock on owen power though because he is not a top line guy he's he's your second pair defenseman so to me, he gets a lot of Hold minutes. On. A second pair defenseman playing twenty four minutes a game. He gets a lot of power play time. He gets a lot. I mean, a lot of penalty kill time. But he's a sure. rookie. But, he's supposed but, yeah, to. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not got to protect him a little he's bit. Rookie. He's on. He's on their. You know, their first penalty kill unit. But for me, seeing him, you know, again, he he doesn't get to play those top minutes against the team's top pairings, right? So if you have, you know, say for example, they, you know, you roll out Rasmus Dahlin, you're going to play him against you know Matthews and Marner against those guys and you're going to give Owen Power maybe the lesser minutes against you know other you know bottom you know second and third yeah, lines to so, play against Malkin instead of uh, Crosby is that the <laughs> okay you know consolation prize or <laughs> <laughs> he had to play against Nylander instead of Matthews oh boy this so, is getting off the rails yeah, real yeah, quick yeah, for okay. me uh, <laughs> us by the way I, I I shafted Stewart on a on a few games he has played he has started 23 games this year so, uh, and it's not to say that he's not having a good year. It's just I I feel as though Owen Power without Owen Power, I don't know that the Sabers are in this position where like legitimately the Sabers are in a position to take a, a wild card spot. They have kind of clawed their way back uh, because they have four games in hand on the New York Islanders. So that'll be a an interesting race and in seven two and one in their last ten. But I I digress. We'll go back to awards. Uh, should we do the Norris? Well, we're already talking about defensemen. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Uh, any any defensemen that have won the Norris uh, in the last three years on your list? Yeah, Adam Fox. Okay, Adam Fox is in your top. Yeah, I. I all right, all right. Well, let's 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 just let's do this. Uh, who do you, who do you have at number three? All right, number three, I've got Adam Fox. <laughs> well, I didn't want to spoil the rest of the list, but I, I can't see his list. I, I, I'm not with him. He won't share his, his Google password with me. So. No, no, never. Yeah. After I bought all that stuff on Amazon, he got really mad. Uh, it was stuff for the podcast. I mean, I had to have a hot tub. <laughs> What if I bought a hot tub on, bought a hot tub. on That's your great. Amazon? <laughs> had it delivered to my house. Although they do have inflatable hot tubs now, so I that's, wouldn't, that's wouldn't be true. so mad about that. That's, that's true. Um, okay, so Adam Fox at your number three. Um, my number three is Josh Morrissey, who's had okay. a fantastic year. I Honestly, I never thought that Josh Morrissey would be in this type of position. Uh, I'll say he is... He's kind of exceeded expectations career-wise for me at this point. Like a, you know, more than a point per game defenseman. Uh, not only that, he has become far more responsible in his own zone than he has been in the past. Uh, I, I mean, yes, his shooting percentage is ridiculous right now at eleven and a half percent. I mean, that's not, not typical. He does have seven goals last year. He had twelve uh, with six point nine, six point nine percent. He's actually shooting. Far less than he was last year. Uh, if if this trend continues, he'll shoot the puck about fifty times less than he did last year. So he's uh, he's not shooting the puck as much. But I I really like what has happened uh, in Winnipeg for him. I think he's just become you know, that n- solid top number one defenseman that. I think people were hoping that he could become, and he has become, and, and I think that's a credit probably to Rick Bonus, who certainly has taken some players and uh, give their careers a new lease on life, and that is Josh Morrissey. So he's my number three. Yeah, I like it. I mean, I, I almost put him in there in my top three. Um, I mean, spoiler alert, he's not there, but 
um, you know, when, when he was given the reins to the, the kingdom after Bufflin left and, and Truba was shipped out, I mean, it was, it was his, his defense, right? And he's finally, I think, finally coming into where they, they expect him to come. And I think it's because of the, in my opinion, because of the coaching change with Paul Maurice out of there, I think he's kind of uh, opened things up a little bit more for Morrissey to, to do his thing. And, um, yeah, but love what he's able to do. And, you know, for me, I've got Adam Fox at number three. And then at number two, um, hopefully, I mean, I, not, I guess maybe I shouldn't say hopefully, but um, I'm assuming he's on your list. And I have Eric Carlson at number two. Okay. Yeah, Eric Carlson's certainly on my list. Yes. Um, okay. Now, he is he is one of those exceptions. Like, yeah, he's on a, he's on a terrible team. Uh, but he's putting up such, such fat numbers that you can't ignore <laughs> 13 right. goals. I mean, he's kind of having that season that Kale McCarr had uh, where you were like, is this guy going to get like 20 or 30? Um, I don't think Carlson's quite at the 30 goal peak there, but uh, I, it sure looks like he's going to get 20 goals again. And uh, yeah, he's uh, he is my, actually my, my number one. So you keep, you keep stealing wow. my thunder here. Maybe I should just li- list off all my guys because uh, – did you see my? Can you see my list right now? Is that what is that what's happening? <laughs> if only. If only. Although I do have your Amazon password, so I'm buying a hot tub. Perfect. Right now. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I mean, and here's the biggest difference uh, between this year and and almost like really the last time that he put up big numbers, which I'd say 17, 18, which is in Ottawa. He had 62 points. Uh, the year before that, he had 17 goals, uh, 71 points, and. He is on pace to have the same amount of shots as those years uh, at 218, 196. Like he was, he was at least hovering around 200 shots, if not far more. And uh, he already in 39 games uh, at 108, 108 shots. Uh, last year in 50 games, he had 117. So he's definitely shooting the puck far more, uh, close to, to four shots a game which is very high for a defenseman. And that's really changed things for him. And it's changed things for the Sharks, uh, at least from you know from his standpoint. I know the Sharks aren't necessarily winning, but at least the Sharks aren't, like, dreadful to watch. <laughs> They're not like <laughs> – they really aren't like Anaheim and Chicago where you're – yeah, they, the Sharks let in a lot of goals, but they also score a good amount of goals. Like, they're at least above three goals a game, which is – something that Chicago certainly cannot say. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I will say this about Eric Carlson, right? He is surprisingly leading the NHL in even strength points. Um, when you consider Connor McDavid and, and Dreisaitl and Matthews and what those guys have the ability to do five on five, it's crazy to me that Eric Carlson is the guy who's leading that charge right now. Um, and I don't know if that's a knock on, on McDavid and how much he relies on the power play or if that's a, a nod to – to Eric Carlson. There's no knock on going on the power play and scoring every freaking time. I'll give you that. Yeah. <laughs> but so the one thing I will say, and, and, and maybe the one reason why I just couldn't put Eric Carlson at number one is because, um, you know, what he was able to do in Ottawa and he comes to San Jose and not necessarily considering the players and the personnel around him, but because he was sharing those top minutes with Brett Burns and not always getting the number one assignments or the number one power play time, uh, you know, he wasn't able to really produce at the rate he was in Ottawa. And then, of course, Brent Burns leaves. And now all of a sudden, right, he gets those minutes. He gets those uh, that top power play unit time. And now he's able to produce. And so, um, yeah, but do you, you know, think that that's that's as much about the fact that he's maybe finally recovering from that, like Achilles surgery that he had? I don't know. I mean, it's, it's been a couple of years. Right. So, um, you know, again, I'm not not a doctor and don't really know the insides and outs of you know, his health and, you know, how he's been feeling over the last couple of years, but just all things being equal, I, you know, again, I just, I, I can't put him at number one just because I feel like, okay, you weren't able to do this last year when scoring was up, but now because you get more minutes, you can do it. And yeah, I but, mean, but he's only it. getting a minute and a, a, a minute 44 more a game right now. Yeah. But I, again, those minutes, you know, might be against, uh, or are with better players per se, for example. Yeah, but like, San Jose right? has no good player. No, well, well like, I, I mean, Logan eh, Schur and couple, Timo huh? Meyer. I mean, now he gets more time with those guys, maybe where Brent Burns was getting more minutes with them, and now he's, you know, Carlson was playing with their third-line guys So you're a lot saying more, that you so. have to play with good players to <laughs> produce. I'm just saying the fact that 
Eric Carlson should be this good all the time, no even, matter who even he's Connor McDavid with. plays with Leon Dreisaitl. <laughs> let's, well, let's not let, forget let's, that. There's there's always going to be that correlation, right? You play with better guys. You're Matthews more, plays right? with Marner. Uh, yeah, Robertson plays with Pavelski. Like that's that's pretty much how. I mean, there's not there. It is very rare for, to have a really good player play with two absolute garbage players and perform well. Well, I mean, I'll give you that. I mean, it's, unless your name's Sidney Crosby, but <laughs> that's uh, true. That's true. Although uh, uh, Jake Getzel might have something to say about that because well, Jake yeah, Getzel I mean, I'm, I'm talking different. a few years prior to uh, Getzel, you know, when like like Hall of Famer Chris Kunitz. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't, little, I don't hate Kunitz, but no, I don't uh, hate him. But he, yeah. yeah, I mean, he he made all his money because of Crosby. All right, that's all. Uh, right. Okay, uh, I, okay. My yeah. number one. Who'd you win? Who won? Yeah, my my number one is Rasmus Dahlin. Um, oh, I just Rasmus love Dahlin. his game right now. I've been, I've been, and and maybe this is because you know being East Coast and getting to watch Buffalo a lot more, being a Detroit fan. I just just watching Dahlin's game and what he's able to do on that ice. It finally seems like. He's come into you know his own, and he's finally cemented himself as a number one defenseman. Whereas, like you know, before he got drafted, and we're just waiting for him to develop and finally hit his stride. And I think he's finally hit it. And he and, had he had like, I mean, two years of oh boy, is he gonna figure this out? Right, like worried. Did they? Is this gonna be a bust pick? Right, and man, I mean, and don't get me wrong, it helps that Tage Thompson right. and. You know uh, the rest of that. that Wait, Buffalo you need team is... good players to be good. <laughs> good players yeah. around you to be good. Yeah, odd uh, concept. Definitely. Um, but uh, yeah, I just I just love Dalian's game. I think he plays better in both his own end and the offensive zone better than someone like Eric Carlson, for example, who in his own end, I you know again I never been a huge fan of him defensively, and so uh, Dalian, I watch him play. He his always own just always had the puck. Well, yeah, I mean, there's it's not that, his fault. But <laughs> I, I'll say Rasmus Dahlin, his numbers are inflated because of the power play. Um, so to me, like his numbers aren't quite as impressive to me uh, as Carlson, who's, I mean, uh, 18 even strength points for Dahlin and, and 38 for Carlson, or 39, sorry, for Carlson, as, uh, and 27 for Morrissey, who I had again, uh, ahead of him. Uh, even Adam Fox has... Uh, has more than he does even strength points, but I actually my number I didn't give my number two. Um, I'll just toss it out there. I have Kale McCarr at my number two. Okay, um, still think that he's uh, once once they get everyone back healthy, he's uh, he'll he'll be far above a point per game here and and be in the conversation again. Uh, he just has they just have had no one, uh, but he is. He is leading all defensemen in time on ice at 27 minutes and 14 seconds. Uh, that's outrageous. <laughs> yeah, shades of Shea Weber and Ryan Suter. Dude. Yes, yes. He needs to play less, but uh, <laughs> I, I have to put him on. I have to put him on that that Norris list because he's just been he's held Colorado together, honestly, while everyone else is uh, tending their wounds. Well, let me ask let me ask you this because um, I know a lot of people were upset. Uh, with you know Kale McCarr being the pick for the All Star game over uh, Rantanen and, and McKinnon, and so I, I'd love to know your opinion. You know, who would you have rather seen with that All Star pick? Would you have seen McCarr or, or one of the other forwards up front? You know, I I I, I looked at the you know who who went. Um, there's other ones like like Boston. Okay, Linus Allmark. Yeah, he's having a fantastic year, but you know, what about Patrice Bergeron or or Marner with Toronto? Well, I know Matthews isn't having his greatest year ever, but what about Matthews? Like, do you want to have an All-Star game without your your reigning Hart Trophy winner? I know he's not going to win the Hart <laughs> Trophy this year, but still, I mean, there's I, I also Connor McDavid's there, but not Leon Draisaitl, right? So, all these guys are going to get voted in. You know, how many there's there's uh what Eight. You get two skater and one goaltender right, vote. Right, so eight uh, skaters and another four goaltenders that are going to be in here. So yeah. I got to think that you know some of these, some of those names are going to be uh, the ones that appear. But I just, yeah, I, I don't really care who appears <laughs> for the All Star <laughs> game. That's. I, I want to go back to the old school East versus West, like we had with. You know, gosh, Owen Nolan and Dominic Koshik, back oh, yeah. to those old days, man. I mean, those All Star games were fun to watch. I think that uh, you know they're they're milking the three on three right now, and I get that. Uh, I think that eventually 
there's got to be some kind of like, okay, we're kind of over this. Like the all-star game doesn't have to be the same all the time. So it, it, it could be switched up. Uh, but I even love when the players were drafting each other and Ovi's trying to get picked last so he could win the Honda. Right. I mean, that was right. great. Um, and, and I'm sorry to answer your question about Kale McCarr over McKinnon or, or over Rantanen or, uh, I I will say that I I'm going to take Kale McCarr all day because the other teams like Minnesota has to send Kaprizov, Arizona has to send Clayton Keller. The the Dallas Stars are certainly going to name J, uh, send Jason Robertson. St. Louis uh, they could send whoever they want. Uh, they don't really have much going on, but Tarasenko <laughs> makes sense. Uh, so for Colorado, you kind of have to look at it and go, well, they need Kale McCarr more than they need Rantanen on that squad because sure. you know I guess who would you instead you might send you've got Pareko I guess there's Heiskanen but you're not going to send Heiskanen over Robertson so that's that's not an option um, I suppose you could send Chikrin that would be probably the other option uh, but he just hasn't played enough to uh, to go to the right. game, unless he gets voted in which you won't because there's no Arizona Coyotes fans out there who vote oh. sorry you uh there's just not enough of you i'm so sorry there's only 3500 a game so <laughs> just not enough um uh, okay so shall we go to what do what you up uh, you want to do the vesna i know you love the vesna oh uh, let's talk vesna. are you ready Why for not? the vesna okay uh well i'm gonna give you my my first or well my my number three so that you know you can keep keep uh going here uh, as I know, I know you've, I'm sure you've got lots to say. Uh, my number three, I have a hard time not keeping him on the ballot after winning it last year. So Igor Shesterkin, even though he has had, he had a little bit of a rocky start. I mean, by the way, the people were talking, you'd think that he uh, was letting in six goals a game. Uh, the guy still is a nine seventeen save percentage, two, four, three goals against he's 18, six and five. Um, he's having a good year, and I'm not ready to say that he's not going to end up with having a great year. So I'm going okay. Shesterkin number three. All right, yeah, a little early for me. I actually don't have Shesterkin on this list, and it's yeah, that's okay. I, I mean, it's it was tough, right? I, to, I mean, there, there's together. there's a few good goalies right now. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> actually, there. Well, what do we what do we have? We have uh, goaltenders. Well, you know, aside from these. Uh, Aside from these these guys who have played what one game, but as far as like goalies who what have played more than ten games, you've got you still have quite a few goalies that are above the league average. Twenty six goalies above the league average um, in terms of save percentage, which I believe is nine oh eight this year so far. Mm-hmm. So there's there's enough goalies that are that are playing real well. Lots of goalies above above nine two. I mean, there's seven goalies above nine two. Yeah. Not, not too shabby. So, um, But for me at number three, I've got uh, Ilya Sorokin, who was my preseason pick to win the uh, the Vesna. Yes, he was. Think. Yes, he was. Yeah, this guy's just – he's too good, and I think he's really uh, – outside of Matt Barzell, I think right now he is the guy that's been holding this this, fran- this franchise afloat in the playoffs. And Yeah, uh, but Semyon Varlamov has very – very comparable numbers and is he's a very a good more. goaltender too <laughs> he's winning a lot more he's eight and yeah. three yeah I'll, I'll give you that. 14 and 13 he, not though he does not get the goal support that's no. for sure no he doesn't yeah i mean listen the, the islanders had the second most goals scored or the second least amount of goals scored for teams in a playoff position in the east right now uh outside of carolina and i think uh that's going to change here pretty quick i think it'll be the islanders in, in last place pretty soon now that patch back but um, yeah, for me, I just I love watching Sorokin's game. He's so focused, calm, and I think he, um, you know, when I look at a lot of the other goaltenders out there right now, Sorokin to me just seems more fundamentally sound than most of them. He doesn't have to flop around a lot. He's very structured in his game, and I don't I, like just, I don't like that. I don't like watching just, that goalie. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I don't like, like fundamentally sound. I like watching. Right? I like watching Curtis Joseph all day long. <laughs> I like watching Dominic Hosh. I'll give you that. I prefer that for sure. Uh, yeah, Sorokin reminds me a lot of Carey Price. I mean, he's just he's like smart. a vacuum he knows, cleaner. Yeah, like just, he knows where to go and sucks everything up yep. for sure. Uh, okay, well, my number two is your boy, former 
I believe he won it, what, three or four years ago. Connor Hellebuck. Having yeah, my a number two as well. Phenomenal bounce back year. Couldn't be happier for him. Uh, something that that is, I, I'll, I'll say, you know, with, with Sor- Sorokin's not on my list. I, I'll probably put Sorokin th- four or five. Uh, but he's playing a lot of games. Uh, Hellebuck. And I I think for the Vesna, you got to consider the guys who are playing a crap ton of games because they're just more important to their team. I, the year that Ben Bishop won it and he had like 39 games played, that was a joke. Or or he maybe he didn't he didn't win it, did it? He he was just nominated. Yeah, uh, yeah, he that was, was nominated. He didn't win it. That's a joke. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. You got to play 50 games. Or at least like yeah, you got to play 50 games. I think that's that's my number. You got to play 50, unless you play unless you play 45 games and you win 35 of them. I I don't want to hear it. Oh. Yeah. I mean, look look, he and Shesterkin right now are uh, you know, play 29 games a piece, and uh, you know there's there's something to be said about a goaltender who plays a lot of a lot of games, right? I mean, the the leading games played for goaltenders right now is Jordan Bennington and, and Sorokin at 30 a piece. So you know, Sisterkin, Halbach, they're right there. UC Saros, who you know maybe I'm we should at 29, give him, yeah. Yeah, maybe we should give Saros just a an automatic bid because of making 60, 700 saves 64 last night. Four saves, I believe it was. My yeah, God. fourth most all time, and I just. Crazy, yeah. I don't think anybody will touch in a regular season 70. game. Unbelievable. Yeah, I know, yeah, unreal. But um, for me, for Hollabuck, I, I mean, honestly, by the time the season ends, I think he's going to be close to you know sixty-five games. And I, I mean, why would you want to play anybody else right now if you're if you're Winnipeg? I just, you know, they don't have they don't have a legit number two in my opinion. And um, you know, maybe that's something they go out towards the deadline and try to acquire be. because yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe they look at you know Detroit and you know one of their goaltenders if Detroit's out of it, or or maybe Craig Anderson and Buffalo if they're not in it, right? Because um, getting Hollabuck some rest on the stretch would be super important, especially if uh, James Reimer out there in San Jose, be good, right? Exactly. Good fit. Especially if they you know manage to to lock in one of those top three spots and and create a wide enough gap where they don't have to worry about a wild card. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I'm. I feel like our number one is just off. It it's painted for us. It has to be. The guys lost two freaking games all year, <laughs> <laughs> and one of them was in overtime. One right. regulation game in twenty four tries. Unbelievable. That's Linus Olmark. Uh, twenty one one and one nine three nine save percentage. Two shutouts. One point eight six goals against. Um. Honestly, like. This is, in my mind, just like I knew he was a good goalie. Like I'd never had any doubt that, hey, Linus Allmark, good goalie. I mean, he's had for the last three years above a 915 save percentage every year. Uh, he's a good goalie. And now he's on a, like, he's stable, right? Like that was kind of the issue last year was uh, you had the Tuka Rask BS that was happening. You also... You know, and then that was causing drama with Swayman and Linus Allmark was just kind of the like he was just kind of the steady force there, and uh, he had a really good year last year too at twenty six and ten. Uh, no one's no one's batting an eye at that, and and he kind of just went about his business. And this year he's getting noticed, and he has been phenomenal. Uh, I will say, I mean, you look at his shots again, seven hundred and thirty three in twenty five games. And you look at the shots against for some of these, like Connor Hellebuck in just in 29 games has 936. (laughs) So he's got a lot more. I mean, he's got 200 more shots with four more games played. So that's 50 shots a game to catch him, (laughs) which isn't going to happen. So he's certainly seeing the puck less, but you know what? Sometimes that's harder. I don't know. I don't know if you can speak to that for yourself uh, playing goalie. You know, when you see 20 shots a game, Oh, what's he at? Right right now he's at, uh, oh gosh, seven times, 28 shots, about 28, 29 shots a game. When you're seeing that few of shots as opposed to some goalies that are facing 40 shots a game, what's that like? Yeah, I mean, every goalie's different, right? That's the thing. I mean, me personally, I always felt I was better when I was seeing more shots, right? My mind was constantly active. I was always, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, trigger happy, uh, just ready to go. Whereas some guys, you know, like, Chris Osgood was the the prime example I always like to use because I remember watching him growing up and, you know, he would have games where 21, 22 shots against or where like, 
I, you know, sometimes he would see even, you know, less than 20 shots a game because that Detroit team just was so good possession wise. But, um, you know, and back in an era where they weren't scoring four goals a game, but, um, you know, <laughs> now, I mean, nowadays, you know, goaltenders are, are trained so good. Um, you know, I, I feel like a lot of these goaltenders can do well with less shots against, but again, some goaltenders need to see the rubber to play well. Um, you know, and he, he's obviously one of those guys that doesn't need to see a lot of rubber and, He's, he's clearly been playing very well. And, and to speak on last year, I mean, it, it's crazy to me because, you know, I expected him to come in this year. And, you know, Swayman was so good last year for Boston. I said, okay, cool, they're going to split time, you know, 50-50 right down the ice. And Linus Allmark, Allmark comes in from Buffalo, signs that deal, and you think he's cemented himself as a number one. But Swayman comes in and, and proves, you know, hey, you know what, I've got something to say about this. But Allmark was, was like, you know what, no, fuck you. I'm just going to go ahead and take this. Um, you know, and, and I it's funny because I – I, I don't know who who's been paying attention, but the Cam Talbot this year, you know, when when Fleury was you know brought back to Minnesota, he basically threw a shit fit and it was like, no, 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 I want out of here because I want to be the number one guy. And I wish he would have pulled an all mark and just said, you know what, fuck it, I'm just gonna I'm gonna put up better numbers than you and give the coach no choice but to play me. Basically, is what all marks done right now because that's how good he's playing. And so um, I wish Talbot had just done that instead for Minnesota. But you know, here we are. <laughs> yep, Talbot just wanted to go. Um. Yeah, it's uh quite the season. Uh, okay, let's go to what do you, what do you think the selkie? Did you do a selkie trophy? One? I did a selkie. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. 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 You know, I, it's, I know. I know it's one of the normal ones, but uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, who do you have at number three for the selkie? Ooh, at number three, should I say Patrice Bergeron? <laughs> okay. Sure. Patrice. No, I'm Bergeron. kidding. Actually, I don't. <laughs> but that would be uh, that would be. Yeah, you know some uh, of the some of the the normal face like Patrice Bergeron, he's going to be there, right? Like he's just going to be there. That's probably in the voting. You're probably like in the real voting. You're probably going to get Patrice Bergeron there. Enough votes to get him in the top three because he's just that good. Uh, do you do you agree? Do you think he'll be in there? Oh yeah, said I, and done. Yeah. I, I think it's almost like a given, right? I mean, he's just like an honorary guy. Um, that has to go in there, but, um, you know, for me at number three, um, maybe a little unexpected, um, you know, this year, but I put Brandon Hagel in there at number three, uh, from the Tampa Bay lightning. He is second in the league in takeaways behind Jacob Slavin. And obviously, you know, defensemen don't count for the Selkie here. So, um, you know, he leads all forwards as far as takeaways are concerned. And he's only given the puck away 23 times. And when I look at other guys who are up there, as far as like takeaways, things like that. Um, like for example, Mitch Marner, right? He's a great defensive forward in my opinion. Um, you know, always playing well on the penalty kill and, and does such a good job up front, obviously as, as an offensive threat, but, uh, he's got 43 takeaways, number five in the league, but he's given the puck away 44 times. And to me, if you want to be considered for the Selkie, I just, I think you have to take the puck away more than you give it away, um, to just qualify for that. So, um, for, for me right now at number three, I've got Brandon Hagel. Okay. Uh, well, my number three, I know this is, uh, this is, you know, just going down the road, but I've got Patrice Bergeron. Cause like I said, you just can't, I can't, <laughs> I, I don't think that he wins it, but I think he's still in the conversation and you know what? Sure. His team number one in the league and they're the best defensive team in the league by far. Like it's, it's not even close. <laughs> Boston yeah. has let in 85 goals. Uh, in 38 games, so just over two goals a game. And the next closest team, I believe, is the new, oh, you know, Winnipeg Jets at 97. So there you go. There are two Vesna Trophy, like one, two, are the two teams with the best defense as well. Uh, the best defensive numbers, at least. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going Ber- Bergeron all the way. Um, I don't think he wins it, though. I think that you know, it's that torch is, is likely to be passed here, but uh, still having a great year, still does everything everything the way it should be, and I can't take him off that. Uh, it's got to be on the ballot. That's fair. I didn't put him on the ballot just because maybe it's, uh, um, you know, just getting sick of seeing him on there all the time. So yeah, that's fair. <laughs> just leave him off. That's but, fair. Maybe uh, I took the easy way yeah. out. Yeah. I didn't I mean, even have to think. Patrice Bergeron. I don't even think it's the easy way out. I think it's always a good decision. Right? Well, so. thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so for number two, for me, um, who probably, I mean, I guess you could have argued that 
you know, maybe this is where I was going to put Bergeron if you were listening uh, right before I named my list. But number two for me is Austin Matthews. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he has really talked, like played his way into that conversation. I love, let me hear your thoughts, Mike. Yeah. I mean, so when we, when we looked at all the injuries on the back end for Toronto a while back and goaltending was uh, getting injured as well, I thought, you know what, I don't know how this, this Toronto team survives for too long without key players. They're going to have to go in and bring in defensive uh, defensemen and, and really lock it up back there a little bit more if they want to have some success. But um, what Austin did and what this I think this team did as a whole is they started to uh, play a better defensive game all around. And you and I have spoken about this so many times. And, uh, you know, one of the key stats, obviously, he's he's up there as far as, uh, you know, takeaways are concerned. And he's got more than more takeaways and giveaways. But what I really liked when I was looking at some key stats and what drew my eye to Austin Matthews and why I think, you know, not only is he so good in the faceoff zone, but he is number four as far as sh- block shots by forward skaters. So uh, sitting at number four with 44 block shots, number th- one is Nick Benino at 53, and uh, there's Garrett Hathaway and, and Anze Kopitar in front of him. But obviously Hathaway and Benino are those guys that are, you know, on the third line, and they're, they're usually in the defensive zone more than the offensive zone. So. I kind of cast them out when I when I look at these stats and you know when Austin Matthews sticks out you know behind Kopitar then when you look past guys that can contribute offensively I really like that and so uh, to me that's why I, ha- I just had to put him in at number two. Okay, yeah, I, I mean I love the pick. Uh, I I think that I had at least I had talked about him uh, last year when we had done this to say you know hey we it certainly is uh, that that's where he should be. He should be in that conversation of, Hey, this guy is, is actually a good defensive forward. Um, however, it didn't, uh, he scored 60 goals. You're just not going to win. Like, I mean, I guess Sergei Fedorov probably is the last time to win the heart and the Selkie. Right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So I actually have at number two, funny enough, I have Mitch Marner at number two (laughs) who, uh, I believe, I mean, the guy has just come alive uh, from a defensive standpoint. And, I mean, he just kills penalties all day long. Uh, it just is, he's just a monster on the penalty kill. And he's a big reason why the Leafs penalty kill is what it is. Uh, and you, you don't necessarily, you know, he's 17th in the league in uh, in penalty kill time. Which okay, seventeenth in the league. You look at all the names above him. Uh, there is only one other name, uh, who I would consider uh, maybe two that are are superstar type players, uh, and that's Nico Heischer, which superstar might be pushing it. Uh, a very good player, and then Elias Lindholm as well. Uh, other than that, you've got a lot of basically your like penalty kill specialists. Uh, but Mitch Marner kind of in that conversation as well, as as well with Austin Matthews. And, and wouldn't it be funny to see that duo of, of players who are just scoring at will for a while uh, to go, you know what, we're going to just change our game and we're still going to put up big points, but we're going to be so good defensively. And it almost has echoes back to none other than Michael Babcock. So uh-huh. remember he was like, I'm going to make these guys into good defensive players and they're going to hate me for it. But They'll appreciate it someday. And, hey, I can't say that this is all because of Babcock by any means, but certainly he you could say that he laid a foundation that uh, maybe is is finally coming to fruition. We'll see if it actually results in anything. Well, yeah, it reminds me of, like, when my dad, when I was younger, he used to always tell me, hold the flashlight, I'm working on this. And I'm like, what the frick? I don't want to sit here and do this. (laughs) And then I get older, I'm like, oh, shit, I know how to do this because he told me to hold the flashlight. Yes, Fuck, I can yes. change the, I can change the drain on this on the sink. Oh my god! Or you that's think, amazing. Oh, my dad did that. that. That wasn't that hard. I'm sure I could figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful. Okay, well, who do you have winning the Selkie Trophy? Yeah, the Selkie winner for me is got to be none other than Mark Stone from the uh, Vegas Golden Knights. Okay, all right. What uh, what brought you to this conclusion? Well, I mean, just the fact that he's kind of got shafted a little bit over, um, you know, last year, I thought he probably should have had it. Um, Don't get me wrong. I I got nothing against Patisse Bergeron. But, um, you know, again, I I think, you know, 
Mark Stone, when I look at his play, not being a centerman, right, I think it's even harder to get recognition. And the fact that over the last few years, he's, he's got a lot of recognition as far as his defensive play. And you look, he's second in the league right now as far as forwards, as far as takeaways are concerned. And he's, he's taken the puck away 47 times, giving it away 22. So, um, you know, his ability to play without the puck is just so fun to watch. And especially because he's, you know, spent a lot of time playing with Chandler Stevenson and maybe not Jack Eichel as much. Uh, his lines haven't been as consistent all year long. And so, you know, when you when you don't have that chemistry, knowing where other guys on your line are going to be, he's still able to go out there and, you know, play a good defensive game. And, and, and I mean, look, it's led to a lot of success for the Vegas Golden Knights. And, um, you know, he spends about 15% of his shift starts in the defensive zone versus 21% in the offense. So, um, you know, he's getting a lot, of, a lot of shifts in that D zone, whereas a guy like, for example, Evgeny Malkin is only getting 4.7% percent of his shift starts in the defensive zone um so you know you can you you can clearly see how much they rely on him to play that good defensive game and it's it's led to a lot of success uh yeah can't complain about that uh mark stone probably should have at least one selkie on his uh on his mantle you would think that he would but he does not uh unfortunately he's not going to get it from me (laughs) i did mention the name already of who is winning my Selkie trophy this year. Do you remember it? Do I remember? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I mentioned him the last time I talked. Last time Ooh. I opened my big mouth. And Are you going to give it to... Uh... And I said that Nico Heischer was ahead of, uh, okay. of Mitch Marner on that penalty kill. I just, man, you know, for all the... For all the tire pumping of Jack Hughes, and not that he's not deserving, he's been really good. Uh, New Jersey has been very good. I think that this all has happened because of the maturity of Nico Heischer and his defensive game. The guy kills penalties like a monster. The, I, I mean, he's incredibly responsible. It shows in his underlying numbers. It shows in in the number, like just run of the mill numbers. Uh, He's scoring goals. He had 37. He's, you know, he's 18 goals, 37 points. He's at a point per game. And the New Jersey Devils are, yeah, I know they, they've struggled a little here lately. Uh, but New Jersey Devils are a, a much better team than they were. It sure looks like they're going to make the playoffs. And while I like Jack Hughes, I think that it's because of the defensive abilities of Nico Heischer to bail them out. So I'm going Heischer for the uh, for the Selkie, a new winner of the Selkie. Doesn't okay. happen very often. The Selkie is like the one. I mean, the heart could just go to Connor McDavid every year, but <laughs> people are like, "Well, let's look for a reason not to give it to McDavid." You know, like this year he's right. gonna. He's. I mean, well, we'll talk about that. But uh, yeah, well, I, yeah, it's, but, it's funny. Dad Zook was running it for a while, then Bergeron came in and just started taking over. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's it's almost like a given. We just we don't think much. We just like okay, give it to him. He's just that good. Yeah, yeah. And and it's funny because there's just so many good defensive forwards out there that put up big points too. Uh, that I mean, a winger should win it here and there. You know. I, it shouldn't be the same player winning it every single time. It doesn't need to be the number one center on a team every time. It's just dumb. Yep. It's dumb, especially since it's the dumb. league's become less positional. So, um, okay, where do we want to go next? What do we have left? We oh, have, I don't, how about... Uh, oh, do we want to do uh, what? Least likely to score? Yeah, yeah. let's, let's, let's do it. Let's okay. go. Least likely to score. Um I prefer to put forwards on my list because they're the ones who should score. Like, for example, uh, by the way, last year the only two players that didn't score were defensemen. So <laughs> it yeah you know, it it doesn't it doesn't happen very often that uh, that forwards don't score a goal. That's why it was so crazy when Riley Sheehan's coming down the pipe with no goals, and he had played. What he had played like eighty one games. I think he played every game. Uh huh. So uh, that's it is crazy when that happens because normally you just you don't last. Uh, but one guy who I think could be with his team for you know the majority of the games he uh, he's played in thirty so far. That's Ryan Reeves. Ryan Reeves has no goals. And see your pick. 
he he's just my he's he's my number three, Ryan. Okay. Reeves. So, unlike he's only playing about nine nine and a half minutes a game. He's start like he's he's got a specific role, right? So he's almost like your modern day enforcer kind of vibe. So Ryan Reeves unlikely to score a goal, I think, but maybe not the most li- unlikely. Yeah, I I will agree with you there. I did put a defenseman winning this just because, um, you know, while I agree with you, I think a forward is more likely to score a goal. So picking a forward might be a a better, I guess you could say maybe a better argument or a better, you know. Well, I do have a defenseman on here too, but I, I, it's just, I I want to, I want to throw out more forwards than defensemen, I'll say. Sure, sure. Yeah, but for me, I love. I love picking on defensemen because they're typically on the ice a little bit more. Maybe they don't get as many shots, but uh, they're a little bit more fun to pick on, in my opinion, especially if they're, you know, more recognizable, I guess, defensemen, right? Sure. So, sure. Um, yeah. But, uh, gosh, yeah, I think, you know, for me at, at number three, I, I had to go defenseman. Um, and I had to I, – I picked Kevin Shattenkirk um, just because – you know, again, when I when I pick defensemen, typically I, I like to look at guys who are offensively gifted and are expected to score a lot of goals, right? And Kevin Shattenkirk's been one of those guys that, you know, is supposed to be seeing power play unit time with Anaheim. He's supposed to be, you know, he's their one of their top four guys, uh, really. But, I mean, because of the emergence of, you know, some of their, their younger players and, you know, Cam, you know, Cam Fowler getting a lot more minutes this season, he's been sort of relegated to the third pairing, but still through 35 games, only nine assists. No goals on seventy-two shots. So seventy-two shots, by far the most shots taken by one player without a goal this year. The right. N- the next most is forty-nine shots, and that is Ryan Suter. Right, and, and, and I mean, uh, look, Marcus Kevin, Peterson. Okay, yep, and, and I mean, look, uh, you know, Kevin Shattenkirk had eight goals last year, so it's not like he he can't score. I mean, right. traditionally defensemen don't, but well, and if um, you're taking seventy, if he takes another seventy-two shots. And nothing goes in. That's got to be the <laughs> the worst luck. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> the worst so, luck. So he's got to get one. But uh, yeah, for me, he comes in at a number three. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 tossing Owen Power on my list. He's my defenseman that Woo-hoo! I included because uh, you know I would be really cool to see someone win the Norris Trophy and uh, or sorry the Calder Trophy, but not score a single goal. That would be cool. That would be interesting. I, I bet you there's never been a skater. I'm sure that's, uh, that's done that one. So I'm sure, <laughs> but he does have a goal, doesn't he? Does he have a goal in his career? Yeah, he has two. Uh, yeah, I think he he scored. That's a couple what's last crazy. Year. He scored two goals in eight games last year, and 33 games in, and he's got nothing. Um, Wild. All right. So who's the least likely player to score a goal? Well, for me, number two, I, I forgot to mention oh, Ryan oh, Reeves. Sorry, you talked about oh, him yes. really quick. So. Um, so he comes in at number two for me just because, I, again, he's a forward that I agree with you. He's going to be playing every single game this year, in my opinion, for for the Minnesota Wild. But, you know, again, regulate, you know, relegated to that fourth line. So we'll see if he can eventually put one in when he's not fighting somebody. And then at number one for me, I, I kind of had to pick on him just because he was in Detroit last year. And, um, you know, I, I was looking at his stats and it was wild to me to see this guy has not scored more than three goals in the last like seven or eight years. Uh, and that's Mark Stahl. So, okay. Uh, yep. Yeah. So I, I mean, looking at, you know, where he is in that, that Florida lineup, I mean, they're not scoring a ton of goals anyways right now, but um, he's playing 18 plus minutes a night. So he's going to see time on ice. And, you know, I mean, he, he granted, he is mostly a defensive player and he doesn't really have the wheels anymore that he once did, but um, you know, and he still can shoot the puck a little bit. I mean, he's still, Watching him in Detroit the last couple seasons, he still knew how to shoot the puck. He just never got it past anybody. It was always deflections. So uh, we'll see if he can try to ring one by at some point this year. My goodness. Try to ring one by. Um, yeah, there's – I mean, there are just some fantastic names that could be put out here. Uh, but the one that I am I, – I guess I'm looking and I'm going, all right, who do I want – like, do you remember last year – uh oh my gosh! All of a sudden I'm blanking. Uh, f- forward on the Seattle Kraken, who uh, who came from Colorado. Came from Colorado in the expansion draft, and he and he had like no goals halfway through the year, and he had scored twenty the year before or something. Oh boy! Um, Yikes! 
Wow. Giant, somebody's sitting at home and they're going, you dumbass. <laughs> it's this player. And and we'll just we'll just go back and delete this. But Why am I blanking on that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, I know. I was thinking about him like a few seconds ago, and now it's just gone. Uh, but anyways, he like it was one of those like, wow, how do you not have a goal? And <laughs> so I don't think that there's any of those this year where you're like, well, that guy scores a lot of goals. Where did you go? Uh, so that's the thing. Like with this. It's a little bit harder to uh, to nail down someone because there might be more more players not scoring a goal uh, than ever because of that. But uh, I'm gonna just go Ryan McDonough. He's playing a lot and he's actually having a really nice season for the Nashville Predators. Uh, he's like one of the few bright spots, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but he can't score a goal and he and he might not score a goal at all. So the player that I'm thinking of is Jonas Donskoy. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, anyways. Uh, yeah, that's my... I mean, pick anyone you want, and it's it's just something to root for. Like, I'm all, I'm, you're always rooting for somebody to not score any goals, but particularly for me, a forward, which uh, there are very few forwards with no goals in the NHL. The other one, Cole Smith for the Nashville Predators and David Gustafson for the Winnipeg Jets. Sammy Blaze for the New York Rangers and Colin Blackwell for the Chicago Blackhawks. That that might actually be a good choice. Colin Blackwell, a good little player, but just in a terrible situation <laughs> uh, to not score. So just what four forwards that haven't scored a goal. So we'll see if they can uh, do what no one could do last year, and that's not score a goal. Try very hard not to score. Uh, there you go. What's uh, what's what trophy do you want to go to next? Uh, let's do the Jack Adams. Okay, yes, the Jack Adams, the Coach of the Year. Uh, all right, well, drop it. Where, where, who do you have finishing third for Coach of the Year? Okay, yeah, finishing third. Andrew coach Brunette, of the year. assistant coach yeah. for the New Jersey Devils. What if an assistant coach could win the Jack Adams? I mean, you know what? I've always pondered that just because. You know, again, as a as a goaltender, Have you there's a lot of times where you bring in a goaltender coach and he transforms a goalie, right? Just, cha- you know, yeah. says, you know, we're going to structure your game a little bit more. We're, you're not going to come out as far anymore. You're going to hang a little bit deeper in your net, rely on your quickness and your re- reflexes. And a lot of times it turns a goaltender's, you know. Um, whole career around. Yeah, whole career yeah. around. Really, yeah. That's, that's a good way to put it. And so, um, man, you know, that would be, that would be, that'd be great. Or at least could, should there be a trophy for like, an assistant coach like hey secondary secondary coaching you know that's uh i I suppose we can do it you know that's true we can definitely do that um but okay so who do you have at number three all right yeah yeah yeah. at at, at number three i gotta go john cooper um i know it's an almost like patisse bergeron for the selkie it's just an easy pick but for me yeah but john cooper's never won the trophy before exactly that's the thing never won it which is wild to think about and I think that's kind of unfair because he, he got put into a team that was just so gifted. Uh, he just was stockpiled with all this this great talent, but managed to just put it together. Um, but for me, again, what I really like about him is the fact that, you know, he gets a team where they lose, you know, Andre Palat. They lose all this talent. And, you know, at this, to start the season, Andre Vasilevsky wasn't, you know, stellar as he normally is, right, putting up 920 plus save percentages. And he's been coming around lately, which has been great. Um, but they still seem to play this this very very good team game very structured and you know again you lose a guy like Ryan McDonough but you still manage to to play some great defensive hockey and um yeah they've just they've held the ship afloat and and been doing great looking fantastic so far so I'm sure you know a lot of people are rooting for Buffalo in Toronto maybe to uh to get in or maybe not I don't know but I don't know if you know the Maple Leafs really want to play Tampa in that first round so well, I don't know that Tampa wants to play Toronto in the first round either. <laughs> they barely beat them. Uh, probably shouldn't have beat them uh, based on a lot of those numbers. Uh, well, my number three is uh, the head coach for the Washington Capitals. That's Peter Laviolette. Uh, the Capitals, I know where they sit right now, is uh, is in a very tumultuous spot. I mean, I suppose they're six points up on the on the Penguins, but... They, you know, they're not exactly blowing the world up, uh, but 
man, they, they've had so many injuries. They've had just a lot to deal with on top of the fact that, hey, his best player is chasing probably the most iconic record in the history of the league. And he's got to go out and like, it's, it's just something you have to deal with. Right. And he's been able to coach very well. The injuries have not been a huge issue. And I think they've, they've just found ways to win. And even when Darcy Kemper went out, you had Charlie Lindgren slide in really nicely I mean, this defensive group is not that good, especially without John Carlson, who's been hurt. Uh, and yeah, I just I just like what he has done with this team to keep them relevant. Because I think that if there were a, there if there was a year where we went, well, Washington will probably fall off here because there's too many injuries, and that has not happened. Uh, Washington one win away from being third in the uh, from being second in the Metro, so they've they've held their own. Uh, so I got to give Peter Laviolette some credit there. <clears throat> okay. Your number two. Yeah, at number two, I'm going to give a little bit of a nod to Sheldon Keith from the Toronto Maple Leafs. And not so much because of the talent he has up front, but because of the injuries they've had on the back end. And you know what? Maybe it is because of Babcock a little bit, but I, I think he's done a great job of holding the fort down and, and getting these guys to buy in to playing a little bit more defensively. And, um, you know, when you have a little bit tighter of a structured team in front of you defensively, I mean, it just it shows, right? It translates the wins. And so uh, Toronto has, you know, held, held the ship afloat more than easily uh, since Morgan Riley went down, since, you know, Jake Muzzin was officially just done for the year, quote unquote. But, um, yeah, they, they managed to do, I mean, managed to put up some, some monster wins without having to score, you know, uh, 20 goals a game where, you know, Austin Matthews isn't on pace for 70 goals this year. Like right. I thought he would be. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I like that pick. I don't want to put Keith there because that means he's going to get fired. So uh. that's the same. As always <laughs> um, I have, uh, at my number two, I have Pete DeBoer head coach for the Dallas stars, his first year as the stars coach. And he has taken this team to new heights, new levels. And, uh, they, Offensively, they're fantastic. Defensively, they're still good, and I there's there's nothing to complain about the Dallas Stars, and he's done a phenomenal job uh, taking a team that barely made the playoffs last year. There was a lot of, I'll say it like a lot of depth issues, and he's he's done quite a bit to solve a lot of that. So Dallas Stars may be the favorite in the West to come out to come out of the West of the Stanley Cup Finals at this point. So yeah, maybe. All right. Who do you have winning this one? I feel like you and I, again, similar to Linus Allmark, might have a similar pick here, but for yeah. me, it's Jim Montgomery. Yeah, how do you not? Right? How do you I not? I mean, especially because coming into this year, everybody said, you know what? They're gonna, they're not making it out of the East. They're not even going to be close in that top three there. They're going to have to be playing for a wild card spot. I think everybody had almost written them off and said, you know what? Thank goodness they got David Krejci because they might have somewhat of a salvaged season. And they've just come out and just destroyed everybody. Yes. So there's no reason not to give Montgomery this award at this point in the year. Yeah, Marshawn was hurt early for a month. McAvoy was hurt even longer, too. Yep. And he did all that with a – yeah, just an unbelievable start to uh, his Boston Bruins career. And, you know, he had a really good – he had a, he had a great start in Dallas until it all kind of fell apart with him, you know, for, for personal reasons. Uh, we knew he was a good coach, and I, I hope this – I mean, I hope things keep going well for him until he plays a team that I really like. <laughs> so, but That's fair to say. But I will say this about a lot of those teams. I think that Boston is probably the most equipped for the playoffs. Uh, they, they not only have, I mean, a lot of their players have been there before. They, they just have some hard players to play against too. So uh, I definitely, Boston, like Boston to me is scarier than Tampa in that first round. So I won't disagree with you. Yeah. All right. Uh, are we on to the heart? Well, I've got a, uh, another, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Best stash or best hair, your choice. Yes. Um, yes. But I only picked one. I didn't do a top three for these. So. Okay. All right. Well, who's, who's got your best stash? Uh, Philip Forsberg. The man is, is curling like no one's business. Mm, I, I'm yes. enjoying that stash. Yeah. 
me up. I honestly, I just, I feel like maybe because I see it every game, I just love Austin Matthews' little stash. I'm, I'm a fan <laughs> of it. I'm a fan of it. So he's, he's that's getting fair. Mine. He's getting mine. And uh, who has best hair? Uh, Mika Zabinajad. That flow and that 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 hair, just always looking wet, is fantastic. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I was. Uh, I mean, I can appear. I can appreciate a good flow, uh, which is why I went with William Carlson. Mm, yeah. Okay. I like William Carlson. So. All right. Uh, you know. Hey, keep keep doing your hair out there. You'll you'll win a good award. <laughs> uh, we'll send it in the mail. Okay. Uh, to the Hart Trophy. Oh boy. Was this your I mean, hardest one? It really was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it really was because I mean, right. I, I'm sure he's in your top three, but. Um, it's easy to go on and, and pick Connor McDavid for this award, just hand it over every year. It he wins. Seems like, yeah, but he wins. He he wins. He wins this one. <laughs> he wins. <laughs> Not for me. Not for he me. Wins. He's going to win it. I, I'm sure he will. I'm Justin, actually, he has I'm 75 sure. points. <laughs> I know. He has 75 points. <laughs> but if you can't. Leon Dreisaitl has 60. The next guys have 55. <laughs> he I, has. <laughs> He has 40% more points than the next guy not on his team. That's outrageous. <laughs> That's outrageous. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyways. So uh, I'll give you this, though. I, I will say for Connor McDavid, um, I mean, what he's doing is insane. However, however, when you look at points per 60 minutes, the discrepancy is not really that as big as we thought. And so for me, that's why I kind of – lean towards somebody else I think this year maybe just because I, I said you know what I think um, the fact that Connor McDavid and the Oilers might actually miss the playoffs to me isn't enough to just hand him the trophy at this point because I can't I don't know how you can give the the, the MVP to somebody who doesn't even make the playoffs so right yeah, I, you I don't know I couldn't do that yeah right and so you know the fact that he's he's not that good defensively he's not great in the face-off zone right now and so um, and he gives the puck away, I mean, a lot. Um, and maybe that's because he's always trying to do outrageous things with it. So yes. uh, <laughs> so I can't really hurt him too much on that. But for me, Connor McDavid was my number two pick. Um, and, and I'll just say at, at number three, I, I've got Tage Thompson. What he's doing with Buffalo right now is is fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, he's just – he's so much fun to watch. And especially those mitts for a guy who's seven foot ten right now is just wild. And I hope he just – I hope he just keeps going at, at this pace because, um, for me anyways, I'd love to see Toronto, Buffalo, and Detroit be at the top of this division soon. So if Tage Thompson can propel this team and, and then Detroit can get their act together here in the next year or two, that would just be f- phenomenal. Yes, it would. Um, well, okay, uh, obviously you you know who I'm picking for number one. Clearly. <laughs> so uh, so there's that. Um, but I actually do have Tage Thompson at number three as well. So Okay. Uh, I have Tage Thompson at number three. I think he, I mean, he has by himself turned around the entire organization. That's that's a like that's a bold statement, but I don't know that you could really refute it. Like his season has made people go, "Hey, I want to watch the Buffalo Sabers because <laughs> I want to watch Tage Thompson." And uh, I mean, he's just been electric, and. When he's had big games, they are monster games. What, like five goals? He's had a few hat tricks. Like he just is. He has the ability to just explode on any given night. Yeah, and and that's something that is very unique, very unique. Uh, well, you already you said Connor McDavid was your number two. Um, I'll tell you my number two, and then we can get to whoever, whatever crazy ass pick you have at number one. <laughs> Uh, I have Jason Robertson at number two. Uh, okay. I I mean, the guy, I'll say the same thing about Robertson that I said about Tage Thompson, uh, except for Robertson has other really good players around him uh, on the forward position that it's, it's not maybe as noticeable, but man, Jason Robertson has changed the fortunes of the Dallas Stars. And... I mean, you don't have to look any further than where they sit in the standings to see that. Uh, he's been fantastic. He has made... If you look at Pavelski's stats, Pavelski is having the best year of his career <laughs> <laughs> at 38 years old. And it's because of Jason Robertson and Rupe Hintz. And Rupe Hintz. Uh, but, man, Jason Robertson is just... 
he's he's next level real deal uh and for a winger and he's just he's crushing it so i'm going jason robertson at number two okay who's your number okay. one yeah number one for me is uh jason robertson okay. uh, okay. <laughs> yeah i didn't have a too wild of a pick here i mean so so for me when i when i looked at mcdavid i looked at robertson i thought okay right both of these guys are phenomenal players but McDavid has played a majority of the year with Dreisaitl, and he's getting a majority of his points on the power play. And that's no knock on David, um, on McDavid. I, I think you know, get your points where you can. But for me, Jason Robertson, to you know, is similar to to Pasternak. When he, when Pasta came in to Boston, he immediately drove possession. He drove play in such a way that now we were looking at Marchand and Bergeron as these dynamic offensive players, and not necessarily these just defensive forwards anymore. And similar to, you know, to, to things in Dallas, I think Robertson has come in and helped improve Rupe Hintz. He's helped improve, you know, Pavelski, not to say that Pavelski was, wasn't that good of a player, but I think he's taken him to another level where playing without Robertson obviously wouldn't have. And, um, you know, to me, I, similar to what you said about Tage Thompson, too, I think he's changed the fortunes of this franchise. When you look at when Ben was in here, and Sagan, things were going well for a while, and then they started to come back down to earth. They started really tanking off to where you wonder if they're going to, you know. I, I mean, again, they're a, few, a couple of years removed from a Stanley Cup final, but, you know, realistically, I, I didn't think they were a Stanley Cup contender team when they made it. And, you know, more realistically, I thought they were going to eventually fall off uh, the playoff pitcher. But then Robertson came in a couple of years ago and completely turned this franchise fortunes around where now they have a legitimate threat to score goals every single night. Whereas Ben is just, you know, you get lucky if he scores a goal and, and Sagan, not, I mean, I don't know where, you know, he's fine as a number two, but he's not a $9 million guy. And so um, watching Robertson come in and, and the way he plays and the way he just is electric every night, similar to McDavid. Um, you know, I just, I, I, the, the, sitting number one right now in the central division where Edmonton is just holding on to a wild card spot I can, right now. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. that yeah. they're, yes, as a team, Edmonton is not in that, that spot. But, man, imagine where Edmonton would be without McDavid. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, you could you could easily say that about McDavid no matter where he was. Right? Sure. I mean, he's just sure. – he's that good. Yeah. Um, and there's no doubt about it. And if he continues at this pace for the rest of the year, I mean, they'll they'll easily hand him the trophy – uh, you know, assuming that they make a wild card spot. Now, if they don't, there'll be a lot of debate at the end of the year. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I think it's it's almost cemented for McDavid just the pace that he's playing at. Yeah, if he gets, I mean, right now, almost he's, he's at more than 150 point pace. If he gets 140, 130, I mean, uh, if he hits 150, I don't know that it matters if they make the playoffs. Sure. <laughs> at 150 and- points. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I agree with if you. If he's got like forty more points than the next guy, it's going to be real hard not to give it to him. Yeah, but but so here's the thing: McDavid right now is shooting at a twenty one point four percent shooting percentage, yeah. whereas Jason Robertson's at sixteen, uh, Drysaddle at seventeen. So if McDavid comes back down, you don't you know you, you have to think at some point those numbers are going to come back down a little bit. And so I wonder if he's going to be able Do to keep though? this pace up. Well, I mean, you, you? you're absolutely right because with McDavid, you never know. I'm not questioning um, what's happening with him. But <laughs> the points per 60 minutes, though, aren't that crazy. He's, I mean, they're wild. He's got 4.9 points per 60 minutes, but Jason Robertson's only at 4.44, so he's not too far yes, behind McDavid. Yes, but he's playing more than four, he's playing what four minutes more a game than Robertson. That right. that is also remember that people have been playing against McDavid for. Six years now, seven years, six years. I don't know. They've been playing against him. People know. People, quote unquote, have a. They've got a pretty big book on McDavid, uh, and he's also a center. So he's you know he's he's in a little bit more of a position to. Uh, you know, he's taking faceoffs. He's doing a little bit more than Robertson in that sense. And man, he. I mean, he's out there so much. <laughs> he's probably playing too much. To be honest, they just have not been in. Enga- they've been they've been behind so often that they're playing them more because they're just trying to stay in games because they're desperate to to win. So I don't think that it's necessarily as like I think that he probably should be playing around the twenty minute mark and instead he's at the twenty two minute mark. That's just too much. Um, he's not he's not killing penalties or anything. That's just too much. Uh, 
So I I think there's there's some of that is is skewed because his team has been dip, has been behind. Um, I also wonder they have gone to overtime. How many times have they gone to overtime? Actually, Edmonton has. Uh, let's see. How do I do this? Oh, I don't know how to see how how often they've gone to overtime right now. Um, but I, I was wondering, you know, how much if if you went to overtime a lot, you might have a little bit, a few extra minutes here and there. But anyways, um, I I think his extra minutes are are more we we have to and want to play him more. And yeah, his points per sixty aren't as impressive, but. If Robertson was playing 22 minutes, I don't think his points per 60 would stay the same because hmm. it's just hard to play that much every game. And, uh, there, I mean, there's a reason why, you know, coaches keep certain players to certain minutes because they know where they're most effective. I mean, they've got lots of lots of behind the, behind the door or behind the curtain stats on, hey, this guy plays better when we play him less than 19 minutes a game. Let's keep him at 1830 because when we play him 20 Here's what happens. So, sure. I, I but think, the other part of that is, is Dallas. I think you know, with with Jamie Ben on that third line, Wyatt Johnson yeah, playing so more well. Depth, yeah, yeah, they've got more depth to do it. So, um, whereas Edmonton does not have a third or fourth right. line to play. Right. Very true. All right. Well, there are our mid-season awards. Uh, we'll see if it holds up. I mean, I feel like a lot of those we're going to have have some of these players in the same conversation. But you know what? There has been times where players completely fall off or somebody unexpected kind of rises to the to the top so we'll we'll see what happens there and uh, any final thoughts before we sign off here justin and no no i do not do you want a verona going on uh going on waivers and oh my clearing? goodness dude okay so here's the thing i i thought long very very long about that because i just i tried to fathom why they would do that and i just I think that because he has played so poorly in the minors that teams might be a little scared off because, you know, at least half the league can't touch him anyways just because of his cap hit, so they can't afford to to claim him anyways, um, you know, at this point in the year. Maybe if it was closer to, you know, the end of February or something, sure. But, um, you know, at this point, they really can't. So, um, you know, again, I, I think because of his poor play in the minors right now, um, the fact that he just got off the player system program, I think there was a lot of teams that just felt, you know, we don't want to disrupt this guy's season. We don't want to disrupt him from his family and, you know, move him halfway across the country or what have you. Um, because, shoot, I mean, a team like Seattle would have loved to have grabbed him or, you know, maybe even, you know, Colorado for that matter. Who knows? But, um, you know, I, I think really they were just in a bind as far as, you know, a lot of players coming back. Tyler Bertuzzi's coming back. Uh, you've got Fabry just returned their last game in Detroit and, and they've got guys coming off, you know, coming off injury. So they, they have to clear up spots. And instead of waving some of these younger guys who are playing so well, like, you know, Michael Rasmussen and, and, um, you know, Dominic Kublik, you know, they, they have to find other guys to do so to put on waivers. And I know they already said that they're, you know, keeping three goaltenders too right now. So, um, you know, there's another roster spot eaten up. So, I don't know. It's it's wild, or maybe just people are just that scared of Steve Eiserman. <laughs> well, yeah, I think I think you're onto something about the uh, him coming out, him coming off of rehab. Essentially, I think I'm sure that Eiserman just went. Just please don't claim him. Don't claim right. him. Let him be. He is he like he needs to stay here, but we have He's to. Fragile. We have to waive him because he needs to keep playing in the minors because we we can't bring him back right now. But do not claim him, please. And I think that people respected it. And uh, I have no, I don't know, but I i think that that's, I mean, if somebody said that to you and you go, I mean, yeah, like I'm, this isn't, it's not about money for Detroit. It's about keeping them in the minors, right? So right. it's its purely, I think, To get personal. him back up to game speed. I think personal, like, hey, we, you know, you want to trade for this guy, we, we would, we'd be willing to trade, but he needs to stay here. For the rest, and the, of the other year thing is now teams can, um, you know, teams now that they want to maybe make a deal or we're interested in them now they get a little bit of cap relief if they do trade for him at this point because he's in the minors. True, and so they've got already that that cap buried, and then you don't have to worry about him getting claimed again after wasting assets in a trade. So, um, very true. So it might make it a little bit easier. 
All right, I love it. Well, uh, Justin, you have a great rest of your evening. To our listeners, thank you for listening all the way through the Overtime Hockey Talk Midseason Awards. We will be back to talk about more hockey with you soon. And uh, until then, find us on Twitter at OT Hockey Talk. Justin over here just breaking news like a boss. I think you were top on uh, the Jacob Verona stuff for a while. Uh, so good stuff there. And uh, guys, we'll talk to you later.